go ahead and uh, photons acting like a wave. I showed them diffraction from the single slit as well as the double slit. And now what I would like you to like to show today is something similar, but not with photons or light, rather with what we call electrons. I would like to demonstrate the diffraction pattern from electrons. So what I have here is <coughs> a heater to which a current passes, electrons are emitted by thermionic emission, I have a beam of electrons, and this beam of electrons falls on a thin foil, a really thin foil of, of the so-called lead of a pencil, which is graphite. So the thin film of graphite now, if this graphite is a single crystal, it will have certain planes in it, planes of atoms. And this plane of atoms will act like a diffraction grating. It will act like multiple slits, because these atoms will interact with the incoming electrons and they will scatter off the electrons so it's a grid of atoms, or a single crystal of atoms, atoms arranged in a periodic fashion and they will act like scatterers. And there's a periodic arrangement of atoms. This is what a crystal really is. So this arrangement of atoms, the single crystal of atoms will act like a grating, multiple slits together. So if I draw the optical analogy, I have a slide in which there are multiple slits. Instead of one slit or two slits, I have multiple slits, equally spaced, equal width. Such an object is called a grating. And I will see an interference pattern with a grating as well. So this is an atomic grating. And it's not scattering or diffracting photons, rather this atomic grating is scattering of electrons. And if I have a screen over here, then these electrons that are coming out from the filament, they will be scattered from this foil, from this grating, and they will only impinge at certain points on the screen. And these are the directions in which constructive interference is going to take place. So there will be a discrete scatter of points on a screen. I need to have a screen that is able to glow when electrons fall on it. So I can have a zinc sulfide screen or a glass screen that is coated with zinc sulfide, some phosphorescent material. Some glowing material. So electrons impart energy onto distinct points on the screen and that particular point will blow up. But the only problem with our arrangement is that I do not have a single crystal. Single crystals are difficult to make. So what instead I have is an arrangement of small grains, small regions on the film. Each one of them is a single crystal with a periodic arrangement, but in a neighboring grain, the orientation of the atomic planes is changing. So instead of having a single crystal, I have a polycrystalline sample. That's the only difference. So in a polycrystalline sample, if I were to place a screen, instead of this discrete scatter of points, which represent points where the waves of electrons are constructively interfering, I will get circles or rings. It's as if the electrons on certain cones constructively interfere and they destructively interfere on other cones. So I get rings. These rings are also a signature that these electrons are behaving like waves and they can be diffracted. And these electrons will have a certain wavelength. 
lambda. Lambda can be determined by the energy of the electron. So these electrons are being accelerated inside the potential. This is a positively charged plate, a negatively charged plate here. So there is some anode potential. Some voltage is applied between these two ends. That voltage will be of the order of kilovolts. So that voltage is accelerating the electrons and imparting energy to the electrons and imparting a wavelength to the electron which is given by H over M. M E V, right? And so it's P squared over 2M is the energy. This is E V naught. Okay? So <clears throat> P squared is H bar squared over lambda squared. 2M is E V naught. This means that lambda squared is h bar square over 2 m e v naught which implies that the wavelength is h over 2 m e v naught where v naught is the potential difference all right so if i knew the atomic spacing i could actually determine the wavelength of the electron if i knew the wavelength of the electrons i could actually determine the atomic spacing so let me demonstrate this experiment so what i have in front of you here let me first show you the setup. All right, so what you see in front of you is a cube. This is a tube, and if you could uh, see a side view of this tube, can, can you see a side view of this tube, please? So this is a side view of the tube. Here, there is, inside this chamber, there is a heater, a filament, through which current passes, which is supplied by this supply, and the heater heats up, and it emits electrons, and there are electrodes. There's an electrode here, and an electrode here, this electrode is an anode, it's given a positive potential, it pulls the electrons towards itself, it accelerates the electrons. These electrons then move in this direction, from back to front, back to front. And in between, they encounter a foil of graphite. And these electrons will scatter off. This region of the screen is covered with a phosphorescent material, zinc sulfide, and we would expect to see rings here. There will be a green glow corresponding to the electrons. So let's turn on the accelerating voltage. So this effect is usually hard to see because of the color, because of the dim coloration. But let's see if we can actually find this. Okay, so I'm going to turn off the lamp for a minute. You've seen the apparatus. And I would like to now, okay turn up the anode potential. Need to see a little bit.
Okay, this effect is more vivid at this moment. So here is a, a rain, a dark region, a dark region, a relatively dark region, and another rain. So why do we have two rays? Because there are two kinds of atomic planes inside graphite. If I look at the structure of graphite, it has a hexagonal structure. There are two kinds of interplanar spacings that are made up in a graphite atom. That's why I have two kinds of planes, an inner ring and an outer ring. In fact, if you look carefully enough with the naked eye, the effect is even more vivid. So here, is, on the screen, it doesn't look as vivid, but I think you can see this this ring here, and a dark region, and another ring. Okay, yeah, here it's a bit clearer. A, a bright region. This is the central maximum. These are the undeflected electrons. A dark region, and a bright ring over here. Okay, hey, can you bring the camera to the back? Can you see from the front? find out the radii or diameters of these rings from which you can determine the interatomic plane spacings inside graphite. Alright, thank you very much. So this is all that I have to show today and we move on to the blackboard now. Ratings in which 
you can imagine that I have two kinds of gratings and the spacing between the slits and the gratings are different. So I get two kinds of diffraction patterns. That's why I get two rings here. Okay? Alright, so let's move on to lasers now. Any questions about this experiment? Yes. Sir, did you get the reference point? What is the reference point? What is the target? If I want to take a picture, I would like to find out. I know the length of this piece, so I would like to find out how how much in length does one pixel correspond to in a camera, so that I can find the diameter of it. This is just for calibration. Yes. X-ray crystallography is actually just the same. In X-ray crystallography, instead of electrons, you have X-rays coming in. And X-rays will give you the structure of, of the in, interatomic spacing. It's exactly the same. It's just that X-rays will have a different wavelength. They will have a shorter wavelength than electrons. You need to accelerate electrons to much higher energies if you would like to match the wavelength of X-rays. So X-rays can probe at the smaller, at the finer level, atomic level because it's wavelengths of the order of angstroms. If you would like to have electrons to have the wavelength of the order of angstroms, probably you have to accelerate them to mega electron volts potential, right? So you can do diffraction with X-rays, with neutrons, with muons, with any particle because all of these particles are actually behaving like waves. This is what quantum mechanics is telling you. Yes, any more questions? Yes. So if I just had planes, normal planes and a single pistol, I'll just get one ring. If that's what you mean by symmetry, yes. You'll always get rings, but the diameter of rings depends upon the because if you, it depends upon the interplanar spacing. Because if I have slits of a different width, suppose once I get an interference pattern like this, if I change the width, width uh, the separation between the slits, the pattern expands because of the uncertainty principle. So the separation between these intensity fringes depends upon the slit width and the spacing between the slits. Yes? So there are two, two kinds of planes inside this. You get one ring from one, one set of planes. You get one ring. Yeah, if you hit, the, hit these planes at different angles, you will get different diameters. You will get the spacing of these planes will change. There's a condition for the Bragg condition, which is 2D sine theta is m lambda. This is the, it's not exactly that, it's 90 degrees minus the angle of incidence. So it depends upon the incidence angle as well. All right, so these are technical details which have to do with experiments. But now let's talk about lasers. We finished off our discussion on, on a very interesting aspect. So now I would like to talk about the working of lasers. And hopefully, I will give you some interesting, some mind-boggling applications. Now if I have two energy levels, with a population here N1 and a population here N2, the last lecture I ended off with the equation that the rate of emission divided by the rate of absorption is given by approximating by N2 over N1. This is where we finished off our previous discussion. And what is this N2 over N1 equal to? according to the Boltzmann distribution. Up the Up. Up. Just take a guess. Hmm?
is which energy? Energy of which state? Delta E. The energy of the high level minus the lower level. Delta E over ABT. Is that it? With the minus sign. Okay? So this means higher the energy gap, there's a minus sign here, smaller will be at 2. So it's all intuitive. You don't need to remember this. You can remember the positive or negative sign just by looking at it intuitively. Higher the energy gap, the negative sign smaller than N2. Higher the temperature, smaller is this, bigger is this, higher is N2. Okay, so this is the Boltzmann distribution. Now the problem with this is that if I were to make a graph of N2 over N1 versus say anything versus delta E over KBT this is exponentially going down and it only starts off at 1 so when I put this thing to 0 this population ratio is 1 so this number is always smaller than 1 this means that the rate of emission is always smaller than absorption. So I it, assume it, this means that I can actually never make a laser because my emission can never outstrip the absorption. My absorption always dominates because the denominator is bigger. Excuse me, are you in a classroom? I make an effort, so do others, so please pay attention. So how do we make lasers then? Alright, let's see if we can invert this population. This is what we observe in a state of equilibrium. If everything is fine, everything is in its normal state, everything is in the ground state, we're not disturbing nature as it were. This is what we are presented with. However, we would like to increase emission so that it dominates over absorption. That's what we would like to have in a laser. So let's make an attempt of having this two level system and somehow making N2 bigger than N1. Let's see if we can do that. Suppose I have electron in the lower energy state. Somehow I give energy to these electrons by some means. For example, I can pump in light which has a frequency component equal to the separation between these energy levels which just has the right frequency and these electrons are promoted to the higher level some of them at least but no matter what I do if I keep on pumping energy if I keep on pumping energy at best what I could obtain is an equal population between the two levels that's at best what I could do because as I increase N2, there are two effects that are happening. There is more spontaneous emission because as there are more electrons in the upper state, the term AN2, which refers to the spontaneous emission rate, goes up because N2 is going up. So as more electrons are promoted, the atom will start to emit more light. And when it emits more light, these electrons are downgraded. These come back to the N1 level. So it's very difficult to keep the electrons in the higher level, let alone achieve a population inversion. That's what we want. We want a population inversion. So far from having the capacity to achieve population inversion, as soon as we promote the electrons, this tend to fall down like a waterfall, like a cascade of electrons falling down from the higher level to the lower level and emitting radiation. So I'm getting out radiation, but I'm never achieving an emission that is greater than the absorption because N2 is always larger than is always smaller than N1. The other problem is that if I increase, try to increase N2, Bn2, rho f, which is the rate of stimulated emission, also goes up. And as stimulated emission goes up, even though more light is coming out, but these electrons are down, constantly downgraded. 
At best, what I could achieve is I can keep on pumping energy, and at best, what I could achieve is that N2 becomes equal to N1. So as soon as electrons start to come down, I have more incoming energy, which keeps this fine balance between N2 and N1. At best, I could have N2 equals to N1. But that means that my emission is always equal to my absorption, and my atom is neither behaving like an absorber nor an emitter, let alone a laser, which is amplifying light. All right? So in order to achieve laser emission, or have emission bigger than absorption, what I really need is somehow I need N2 bigger than N1. That's what I would need. I would like to invert the population. So what I really want to have, hypothetically, is the following scenario. I have fewer electrons in the ground state and more electrons in the excited state. But this is being forbidden by statistical mechanics or thermodynamics or the laws of nature. They're not allowing me to do this. So I need to invert the populations. So this is the scenario at infinite temperatures, equal population. If I have N2 bigger than N1, N2 is bigger than N1, this is my formula, then, then just looking at this equation, what do I need to achieve? Delta E stakes, KB stakes, what should be the temperature if N2 is greater than N1? What should be the property of the temperature? I need a negative temperature. So I need a temperature of minus 10 kelvins. I need a temperature of minus 20 kelvins. Now is it possible to have an absolute zero temperature which is in the negative? So somehow I'm trying to fight with nature. Trying to fight with nature, I'm trying to go against equilibrium, and I'm trying to somehow circumvent nature or harness nature or make it go out of in a state in which I can get negative temperatures. This is what I really want. And that's why it took so long to build lasers. Now this out of equilibrium situation, which is called population inversion, cannot be achieved in a two-level system. in most, in 99.9% of the cases. Some other tricks, yes, but I don't want to go into those. It cannot be achieved in this two-level system, so instead of having a two-level system, let's move on to a three-level system. And let's see if we can achieve this condition of population inversion, which is a prerequisite for emission being greater than absorption in a three-level system, in a molecule, solid, gaseous atom in which there are three levels. So now I'm going to talk about three levels. N1, N2 is the population in the excited level. <coughs> and then I have another level, N3, that is in between. And each, this is the ground state, and both of these are the excited states. All right? Now we know that each level has a lifetime. Now, this means that an electron in an excited state will live in an excited state on average for some time, which is tau, before it decays. This tau is really small. It could be of the order of 10 to the power minus 15 is a femtosecond, roughly. It varies from state to state, and this tau can be determined theoretically as well, but it's a very small lifetime. In fact, this lifetime is because of the uncertainty principle, as you've seen. This finite lifetime gives you finite line widths in the energy spectrum. That's why we have, this is the uncertainty principle. You need to have, smaller this tau is, bigger will be this peak on the energy or frequency axis. So this is the frequency axis, and if I take the spectrum, as I showed you the other day with the spectrometer, this every peak has a width. This width depends upon the lifetime. 
Shorter the lifetime, bigger the width. Longer the lifetimes, sharper the peak. This is long lifetime, long tau. And if I make tau shorter, tau is shorter, delta E goes up, which means that my peaks become broader. So my lines are actually broadened because of the uncertainty principle. Anyway, each one of these states has a lifetime. Now the nice thing is, in equilibrium, in equilibrium, if everything is in equilibrium, there will be the highest number of electrons, N1, in the ground state. Of course, there will be some electrons here, but fewer electrons because of the Boltzmann distribution is to the higher energy, and fewer electrons here in the excited state because it's even, it's an even higher energy, and I will always use the Boltzmann distribution to calculate my populations in a state of equilibrium. So this is the state of equilibrium. Now I'm going to talk about a specific laser, which was one of the first lasers made, which is Ruby, which is chromium oxide in alumina. So if I have alumina, and I replace one of the aluminium atoms with chromium, this is called Ruby. Okay, it has a characteristic red color. It's a famous gemstone, one of the earliest known to mankind. So, the first laser was made with the ruby. So, this is a approximate the internal level structure of a chromium ion. This is a chromium ion. So, the chromium is actually a defect inside the pure alumina crystal. So this defect is giving out laser light. Defects are helpful sometimes. Defect means you have a nice matrix of alumina, aluminium everywhere and you replace one of the aluminums with the chromium ions. This becomes ruby. It's very hard to make these ruby crystals. And many solid state scientists actually spend their lifetimes making single crystals of ruby back in the 20th century. So this is the energy level structure. This gap is here, and there's a gap here. And the nice thing is that this level has a lifetime, say, 10 is, I'm just giving you an example. 10 is for minus 15 seconds. And this, but this state over here has a much longer lifetime. Say, 10 is for minus say 10 seconds, five orders of magnitude bigger. So this is a longer lifetime, five orders of magnitude longer. So if an electron somehow lands into this level, it stays there for longer, okay? Such a state is called a metastable state. A stable state means that it will have an infinite lifetime, an infinitely long lifetime, it will always stay there. But it's not infinite, it's longer. On the human time scale, this is still short. This is shorter than the wing of an eye. It's less than a nanosecond. You can't perceive this. But on an atomic time scale, this is a long time. When you compare it to this lifetime especially. So we as humans are used to certain time scales, but atoms, the quantum reality is used to other time scales. The cosmological reality is used to some other time scales. Keep that thing in mind. The cosmological time scale is used to billions of years. Life of the universe is 13.7 or 8 billion years. 10 is for plus 9 years. And here we talk about 10 from minus 15 seconds. 
It's about 35 orders of magnitude difference in the time scale that we're talking about. Anyway, now what we'd like to do is we would like to excite the electron from N1 to N2. Alright, so how do we excite the electrons? There are different mechanisms. We can have a ruby crystal and surround this ruby single crystal with not a coil, but a flash lamp. Now this is a xenon flash lamp as they use in cameras. It gives an intense pulse of energy. So somehow we need to input energy to the system. That could be provided by electrical means, by optical means, somehow. So we pump energy into this system. And what the pumping does, this pumping is called, this is called pumping. What the pumping does is that it excites electrons from N1 to N2. So right now it seems that this or atom or ion far from emitting radiation is absorbing radiation. So how can we make a laser out of it? So we pump these electrons from N1 to N2 by providing energy, by providing some incoming photons, say. So for Ruby, this separation gives me a wavelength of 550 nanometers. Whenever I have energy, I can always calculate the wavelength corresponding to it. E is equal to HC over lambda. So this separation is about 550 nanometers. So I give energy to the system, and when electrons get into this level, I cannot have population inversion because N2 is smaller than N1. N2 is always smaller than N1. I cannot get population inversion. But the nice thing is that this is a fast decaying level. Electrons inside this level decay fast. And they don't decay to the ground state, they decay to the intermediate part, which is N3. So instead of decaying back to the ground state, these electrons decay instead to N3, to this level, at a very fast rate. They rapidly do, do so. So these electrons are now decaying in a fast fashion to N3. Yes? Where is? This is a ruby crystal. So this is inside a ruby ion. We are looking at the energy levels inside a ruby ion. Okay, ruby is, there are ions of ruby inside and this is the energy manifold inside the ruby oil. Like a hydrogen atom has quantized energy levels, the ruby ion has quantized energy levels here. So now what happens is, yes? Is it downward in transition from N2 to N3? So by that standard, why is there excitation from N1 to N3 as well? Good question. If you put in this precise wavelength, there can never be a transition to N3. However, if you put in broad light, or you put in a range of energies, then yes, excitation to N3 can take place, but that will not give you reason. So when this downward transition takes place, some, of course, some light is emitted, okay? Some light is emitted. Now this is a small spacing, so it's a long wavelength, really long wavelength could be the infrared, far infrared, okay? We might not even be able to observe it. It might result in the heating of the crystal. So, but this is a long wavelength. So these are photons of long wavelength that are emitted that give you a broad peak because this time is really short. Lifetime here is really short. Now once electrons, now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to shove electrons, push electrons to N2 with the help of the optical pumping scheme, N2 is never greater than N1, N2 is always smaller than N1, but then what I have is that there's a fast decay to an intermediate metastable state. 
And when this fast decay occurs, all the electrons that have actually shoved up to N2 end up immediately in N3. All right. Now with time, what's going to happen is that I'm pumping up electrons, and they're rapidly decaying to a state in which they live for a longer period of time, because this is a metastable state. It has a lifetime orders of magnitude bigger than this state. So once electrons fall into this intermediate metastable state, they stay there for longer. It's like a traffic jam. I have red light, and cars are come rushing in, rushing in, and they're all converging at the red light, and they're stopping there. So there's a higher concentration of cars, a higher density of cars at the traffic light. Exactly the same phenomenon is happening here. I am constantly putting up electrons into the level N2, and they're rapidly decaying in, into the ground state over here. Uh, sorry, into the metastable state over here. With time, what I will achieve is the following. I'm picking up an electron. Let's consider a single electron. I am promoting it to this state, N2. It then decays through the emission of a photon. So it comes here, it rapidly decays, and then stays here for a longer period of time. So this electron has now been taken away from N1 and has effectively been perched on the level N3, and it stays there for longer. Now, it will stay there for longer, which means that what I could do is I could constantly pump in energy. Electrons will immediately be transferred to the excited state, but they will rapidly decay to this state over here, and they will stay there for longer. This difference of lifetimes actually achieves the population inversion between N3 and N1. I am, in other words, taking away electrons from N1 at a faster rate than they are coming back into N1. Let me reiterate. Let me state this again. I'm taking away electrons from N1 at a faster rate than the rate at which they're coming back into N1. Because they stay there for longer, the transitory stage. The intermediate stage has, is a nice oasis. Everywhere in the desert, this is a nice oasis. The electrons like to stay here for longer. They like to hang out here. So I'm not receiving the electrons. Electrons are not falling back into N1 at the rate at which they're being pumped out of N1 because they stay here for longer. OK? But eventually, these electrons will eventually decay after one nanosecond or so, and when they decay, since a population inversion has now been achieved, there are more electrons here, because they stay here for longer than N1, a population inversion has been affected. A population inversion has been materialized. When this population inversion is materialized, what's going to happen is that these electrons will fall down to N1, eventually they will do so, and in the process, they will emit radiation. This radiation is going to be equal to this level. Suppose this is, in ruby, this is about 693 nanometers. So red light of 693 nanometers will be emitted. OK? Now this is spontaneous emission so far. So far, spontaneous emission, we're not talking about stimulated emission. The electrons at N3 will eventually come down because of spontaneous emission. Now this is going to be a very, an extremely narrow line because this is a metastable state. Long lifetime, narrow line, that's what we have in laser, single frequency, that's what we call monochromatic. 
So we've actually achieved population inversion. We've tricked the system. Actually, nature has provided us means. We don't make ruby. Uh, we can artificially make ruby, but ruby is naturally existing. So this level structure is, is for us, it's provided by nature. This metastable state exists in nature. So let's exploit it. And let's use this metastable state to achieve population inversion. Once population uh, <laughs> inversion has been achieved, this thing is flipped. This becomes bigger than one. It's not flipped, but this becomes bigger than one. Emission, this an expectation that emission is larger than absorption. Now, this is the lasing wavelength. This is laser light. But the story doesn't really end here. There's more to it. Okay? So what's going to happen now is that if I have, this is one ruby ions in, in the crystal. I have many ruby ions in the crystal. And this incoming energy, this pump, this pump beam, which is promoting the electron from N1 to N2, is incident on all the ions. So there are many ions. There's an ensemble of ions. So this pump beam is coming in into all of these ions. What the pump beam does, it promotes the electron from N1 to N3. The electron then falls into N2. So in all of these ions, I have a population inversion. It's the same pump beam that is incident, that is seen by all the ions. I'm getting population inversion in all of the ions. So now, what's going to happen, and this metastable state is the same in all the ions. So in all the ions, the metastable state is long lived and the electron will stay in the metastable state. Now when this lasing wavelength is emitted, in one of the ions, it acts as a seed for a neighboring ion. Now, this is already an excited state here, even though metastable state, but stimulated emission can now take place. The stimulant is now the spontaneously emitted photon from one of the ions. This spontaneously emitted photon from one of the ions can stimulate the emission of a photon from a neighboring ion. So now what this does, this is a neighboring ion, this stimulates, this spontaneously emitted photon strikes neighboring ion, it can stimulate, stimulate the downward transition of this electron here, which now comes down across the lasing wavelength, the original photon remains unscathed and another photon is emitted which is coherent with this photon. Both of them are moving in the same direction, same frequency because it's the same lasing level, coherent, or both of them in the same direction. So now an avalanche, a snowball effect of stimulated emission takes place. The seed, the trigger was pumping which triggered spontaneous emission in one of the atoms, ions and it now is going to trigger off stimulated emission in all of the ions. So in the next stage, this is going to come down. This photon is going to stimulate the emission of another photon. This photon is going to stimulate the emission of another photon. So from two, I get four. Likewise, this builds up. This snowballing effect builds up. And all of these photons are coherent. They are in phase, they are moving in the same direction, they are totally synchronized with one another. It's like a giant army of photons all moving together as one system, as one multi-body system, large system. This is like a giant wave function of many photons. It's a giant wave function. Okay? It's let me write down this word, it's a giant wave function. 
And it's a, what in other words, it's a macroscopic quantum effect. It's not microscopic, it's macroscopic because now there are millions of photons that are all moving together in the same quantum state. Okay? It's a giant or a macroscopic quantum phenomenon. Big scale. You can see lasers. This is a laser. This is what's happening inside this thing. Let me just finish, please. So this stimulated emission now takes place, and this stimulated emission is called light amplification. That's why laser is an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So this is n equals 1000 p. 
This is n equals 1001 peak. This is n equals 1000 second peak. This is the 999 peak. So I will have many wavelengths that can be sustained inside this cavity. And some of them will be amplified, others will be lost, they will be absorbed. Eventually what comes out is that both of this standing wave of photons, giant photons is oscillating inside the cavity. But if these are perfectly reflecting with us, how to get laser light? How do you want to do something useful? You don't want light trapped in a box. You want to get some of it out so that you can do something useful with it. So one of these reflecting mirrors is made only partially transparent. So this is about 99.999% reflecting. This is about 99.1% reflecting. So some of this coherent light actually escapes from the laser and this is what it comes out in a narrow beam, collimated beam. Of course, there is always some divergence. This is now our laser light. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break, and after the break, I hope to answer your questions. Thank you.